Ay, ay, ay. Okay. So this is like four minutes before the official launch, but this will help me to ask people if they're if they hear echo and that kind of stuff that they sure. usually hear. If anyone can hear us, uh, it's still three minutes until uh, <laughs> we start. But if anyone can hear us, you can tell us if you hear some technical problems or whatever the stuff that you usually do. So, um, yeah, is there an echo? Can you guys hear me? Doubles? If so, say something. Nice. Those miniature victories. Yeah. Just a second. Okay, so you hear both me and Anthony. That's that's important. <laughs> oh, some some sound effects. Do you have sound effects? <laughs> yeah, the kid. But, oh, my baby. <laughs> but I, I, I would like to keep that. It gives to the atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, for those of you who are wondering. Um, I'm working from home, so you probably will hear a baby in the background every once in a while. Uh, before we start, please do ex expect some uh, promotional messages from me. Uh, I always <laughs> use this opportunity to promote everything that I can. So, yeah, I think like a few more seconds and I'll start talk talking without, without end. And you, Anthony, also can talk a lot. I've witnessed that, especially after a few motivational drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, just few 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 weeks ago, also I was going through some old footage, you know, and then I found some uh, some videos of you, you know, like uh, leading uh, people to sing or whatever, or clap hands in that uh, VIP bar in Zagreb. <laughs> <laughs> that Always. Was, that was funny. Anyway, so we start right on time. Nice. Uh, Anthony, welcome. Welcome to the stream. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. So before I introduce Anthony and before I allow him to speak properly, uh, I'll do some <laughs> promotional messages, of course. And uh, so, and the reason is, uh, mm, the reason is that uh, we recently do s did some like uh, upgrades to our websites, and uh, you can see the list of uh, uh, websites here. So you know you can uh, go back to the video later on and. Uh, go through those links but uh, I will also show you uh, like what's new so if we go to uh, if we go to the Bunica network site where you probably most of you already have profiles which is our like members uh, website or community website 
uh, you'll see uh, that like new logo is here and the uh, site looks like uh, a bit cleaner uh, but uh, what's new is uh, another Bunica site which is bunica.org and this is the website where only uh, professionals are listed so I'll just show you how this works uh, it's very easy to go through this uh, search filters and the profiles are very simple so here's the Nemanja from Serbia uh, professional artists are allowed to you know upload like up to six images that show that shows their work uh, you can also have a video uh, for example this amazing helmet that Nemanja did and also you have like location daily rate if you want to show it also current status uh, if you're like uh, available for work or not and, and so on and uh, what's really important that uh, like clients can send you direct uh, inquiry through this uh, message form that goes like right into your inbox uh, then uh, recently we have announced the dates for the next IFCC which will happen in Split Croatia beautiful coastal town in the in, on, on Croatian coast, Mediterranean coast, so the event will start on May 25th and uh, early bird tickets will be on sale on 29th of this month. So uh, for those of you who haven't been or don't know anything about the IFCC, you can go to this like video section and uh, you can check some videos here, there are a lot. Uh, some of them are like pretty old, most of them actually, but uh, enough to show you like what's the event about. And then also we did a redesign for the IFCC Academy site where we have online education and uh, so please check this, check that as well. Uh, a lot of content was added, uh, like talks from the, from the last IFCC and some links to some like live streams uh, that we had and so on uh, and uh, yeah that's it uh, the game workshop web website uh, that we uh, usually um, where we had like all the ch art challenges in the past is not that active uh, in recent months uh, because like uh, uh, all those art station challenges uh, took away all the people who were <laughs> Who are submitting works <laughs> on our website? So, yeah, we, we we say like, okay, no, no need to fight with the with the art station. So you know, uh, but you know, we'll probably have some more <coughs> challenges here in the future. And uh, yeah, and all the guys behind this, uh, all this is like people from Bunar Studio. It's only like three of us, so you can check our site as well. Uh, and later on, I'll show you some of uh, Anthony's uh, links. Uh, so now back to Anthony. And uh, so, yeah, like uh, uh, Anthony Jones, uh, we met first time in 2015 or 16. Uh, to be honest, I can't remember anymore. When was it? He was here like uh, <laughs> two times. Yeah it, was about, yeah, it was probably like four years ago. Yeah. Uh, I guess. Anthony was here uh, in Zagreb uh, two times uh, and was really really happy uh, to be able to get him here with some other amazing artists, uh, his friends and colleagues. Uh, one of the like uh, best speakers that we had uh, uh, like on, on stage, uh, he had like this motivational talks, uh, very very inspiring. Uh, some of his idea ideas were like pretty crazy if you ask me but uh, <laughs> it, it was good for the crowd so uh, yeah and uh, who knows like maybe sometimes in the future we'll meet again uh, maybe you'll have a chance to talk to him live uh, at one of the future IFCCs or, or not but since we're here already already you can you know ask questions so uh, today's uh, topics uh, let me show you today's topics. Uh, uh, these are today's topics, and uh, just you know, like if, if you if you have questions, you know, like uh, wait until we you know start talking about uh, you know the theme 
or the topic related to you, the question you might have. So don't post it, you know, uh, don't ask, ask, you know, stuff about, you know, like business, you know, when we talk about his early life and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, now I'll give a word to Anthony so he can properly introduce himself. <clears throat> yeah, I'm wondering what you thought was crazy. Let's get into that. Like, you know, like the, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I, can, I can tell you, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but, but uh, it for later. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I um, so yeah, as Marco said, my name is uh, Anthony Jones. Uh, I am the owner of Robot Pencil, which is pretty much just my alias. Uh, I've been a concept artist for about years now, like since like 2008, so like about 11 years, right? And so <clears throat> I've worked for a lot of large companies. Um, just to name a few, you know, like uh, Sony Santa Monica, uh, Blizzard, um, and even Riot recently, right? And so I've worked for, yeah, I've worked for even a lot more smaller studios uh, and even uh, other bigger studios, but there's a lot. Uh, I do a lot of freelance and I've worked studio jobs as well. And currently what I do is pretty much the same. I freelance, um, but I also just teach. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to do is to teach and to be a part of that world. And as an educator, so I do an online course. I've been doing it for about four to five years. And uh, I don't really see any reason to stop. I'm sold out all the way till the end of the year. So I just opened up my um, classes for early next year, January of 2020. I need, um, I need to borrow some money from someone but it's <laughs> sure. good that you mentioned okay yeah 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 so i uh, i've taught at a lot of different schools um as well like some some nice schools uh like otis um uh, and Noman, to name a couple as well but then uh, i i think i've done just better teaching under my own mentorship uh, i think my mentors my mentorship works the best because it's kind of what i prefer in terms of teaching which is like more of like a, a personal trainer approach, if that makes sense. Like you come in and I show you like where you're at and what you should work on. Um, and as like a, as if I'm like your art, artistic personal trainer, uh, I do like Marco was saying, I, I have a lot of ways to try to get people motivated uh, and inspired because ultimately the way to get better is to con continuously draw and to, to continuously be painting. And I find myself, that's what I do pretty well. And so my mentorship works really well in that regard. And that's pretty much it. So um, currently I'm freelancing for a couple other studios. <clears throat> and I either will freelance as a concept artist or even as an art director, depending on what they need. And so, um, yeah, that's pretty much it in terms of introductions. Okay, I'm showing some of your... Uh... Uh, some of the sites that you mentioned, like <coughs> your uh, Robot Pencil website, and of course, oh, you have like uh, Art Station uh, portfolio, like everyone else, and also mm -hmm. you have a Robot Pencil uh, YouTube channel. So, this, yes, all, all of these are like really good resources. Uh, Anthony, you know, like uh, what I like about you is that you're like very like motivational for, for, uh, uh, for younger artists, but also for uh, those who are trying to find themselves, and always, always very positive, and you know, it's it's really it's really uh, you know, it, it feels good to to watch your videos and listen to you talk and uh, learn something from you. Uh, personally, I'm like really really in love with your work because it uh, uh, it's very similar to what I was trying to do when I was much younger you know when you yeah. probably were so young that you even didn't even start uh, drawing but uh but i really like uh, all the things that you do like with all these uh, shapes you know and organic stuff and but also the hard surface stuff that you do so uh <clears throat> really big fan and also uh it, it was uh, always uh, nice to see how you influence other artists uh, you know like um, Milan Nikolic, uh, another <coughs> amazing artist, like a big artist, big name uh, in art world, was actually your student, and mm -hmm. uh, you, you can you can still feel uh, uh, 
you can still see like uh, some influence of your uh, teaching in his work you know totally he was one of my first students yeah so it's cool to see him do great things so let's go back to the to the topics list uh sure. um, just let me find it here okay by the way if i keep coughing i'm gonna try to meet myself if i do i, I didn't do it before i just came out of surgery uh tuesday of last week so i still got like stuff <laughs> if you know what i'm talking about so i'm, I'm gonna be coughing it, periodically what i noticed like when i talk because my english sucks pretty much and I always uh, it's fine I always have like this you know you know you know at the end of every <laughs> sentence you know and then when I listen to myself yeah. I'm like what the fuck but anyway uh, yeah, yeah. so uh, the business of art for those of you who don't know uh, the business of art is actually something that we started uh, uh, in 2015 on our first IPCC and uh, Mm, it was actually a panel you know we wanted to do something uh, different on our, on our conference it was actually a panel where artists like uh, uh, artists that are like uh, well known that they have a lot of experience like Anthony talk about uh, you know business side of things you know like uh, situations with clients and that kind of stuff so first three guests that we have uh, that we had was uh, Ben Mauro uh, Mike Hill and um, uh, Justin Gobby Fields. Wow, uh, those are some heavy hitters. Yeah, that, it's, it was like pretty interesting. Uh, uh, actually, uh, the third one sh uh, should have been uh, Jan Urschel, but he had to skip the, uh, the 2015 uh, event. So Justin jumped in and it was like really, really great. Later on, uh, we did the same thing. Uh, uh, I think you were also uh, one of the guests in uh, one of those panels. And yeah, totally. People really loved it, you know, because, you know, artists take like 99% of time artists talk about art and they're doing art, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, very often they get screwed by, by, by some nasty clients or, you know, so sure. uh, yeah. the, uh, the, these panels gave them some really, really good insights on how to do business and uh, uh, that kind of stuff. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, your early life, you know, is there something important than, you know, uh, that you should mention that dry, uh, has drawn you to your art career. Yeah, so I'll kind of give like a brief like history of Anthony Jones, and then that led me to the journey of how I became an artist. So like when I first started, uh, I was not an artist by any means. Like I think like I was a creative. Like I did draw when I was a kid. I did do like stuff like this. You know, it wasn't like. Uh, extraordinary though like I wasn't like what you would expect like whenever I always explain this it's like you know there was always that art kid in school right uh, I wasn't that art kid you know what I mean like there's always that kid who's really good at drawing and stuff I was not that kid I was actually the music kid I played uh, in bands <clears throat> and so when I started my journey I was like a, a, by no means like a, a actually good artist and so I worked like, you know, regular jobs, you know, I worked as a person that folded clothes at like the Gap, you know, uh, I worked at like a beer merchandising company where I would go to stores and organize the beers, you know, and eventually I ended up becoming a plumber and this is like kind of the favorite part of my story is because like it kind of demonstrates why I probably do creature design because uh, one day, the day that I quit, we like pulled out a dead cat from a drain. And that was pretty disgusting. And that kind of shaped my career from there on out because I realized I didn't want to do this type of small jobs anymore. I wanted to do something a little more meaningful, you know? And that's when I began to look into like, like what I can actually do. And that's when I went to the Art Institute of Orange County in California which, by the way, is, is, a, is not a great school. In fact, it's shut down. It's not there anymore. And it was not a good school when I was going, and I don't know when it was ever a good school. But when I went there, I at least met some of my favorite people in the world now, like some of my, my best friends and such, you know? And what I really got out of all of that <clears throat> experience was, like, how to become an artist. Because when I first went there, I actually went as a programmer. 
because I, I didn't think that I was an artist. That's how much I didn't really believe in myself. In fact, uh, I was pretty racist because I'm half Korean. So I thought the Korean side would kick in. And I realized, oh, no, yeah, I'm racist. That's never going to kick in. Like, you just got to be good at programming. You got to learn it. And it was super hard. And I saw other people painting uh, and drawing, like, Dragon Ball Z characters. And I remember saying to myself, like, I used to be able to do something like that when I was a kid, you know? Uh, just like other kids. Like, there's there's always someone who could just draw, kind of. And I have I saw that their skill, like, the skill gap between them and me, I felt was, I can close that gap. So then I began to, I switched majors and I began to become an artist and I started to draw all the time. And my, my principled idea at the time was that I'll fake it till I make it, you know, because I definitely didn't believe that I was an artist. I felt like it was a talent and I didn't have that talent, you know, and as soon as I started getting better and better and better and I realized that I was actually good at what I was doing and I was becoming good at it and I was only becoming better the more I practiced it, that's when I started to kind of dissolve this myth of talent and I became, you know, um, the concept artist I am today. And that's kind of my early stages of my career, like the beginning, the origin story. And, um, yeah, when I, fir- when I got my first job as a concept artist, uh, the one that I think really solidified my um, feeling that I am actually a, a genuinely good concept artist was the Santa Monica job. And so I'll, I'll kind of leave it there. But like ultimately, yeah, like that was my beginnings. So how old were you when you when you got your first gig? Uh, what Did you like uh, go to work for a company right away or did you do <clears throat> some freelancing at first or... Yeah, so my first real job as a concept artist, I think I was probably 25, 26, right? Because when I started school, I was 23 years old. And so I was already kind of like, like I already kind of was older for somebody who's like just starting to go to college, especially in the United States. People tend to go to college much younger, right? Like right out of high school. Uh, and I didn't because I did all those other things, like I said. Like I had like other jobs, like real jobs, uh, and had to like really learn how to do that. And so becoming a, uh, a concept artist, like officially, right? Uh, yeah, I was, I was probably like 20, 25, 26. And I did freelance here and there, uh, but I didn't really know much about what I was doing. Like I had no clue what was going on. And that's why I always say like, you know, my first job that really made me feel like I was a concept artist and that I knew what I was doing, that I had some capacity was the Sony Santa Monica job. Right, which that that eventually happened like around the age of 26, 27, right? And what happened was that I got laid off at my uh, first job and I didn't have anything to show for it. Like everything in my portfolio was kind of trash uh, because once I got the job, I didn't really care to get any better, right? I was like, I did it, I made it, you know? And then once the job evaporated, that's when I like that's kind of when I realized that this is a like a career that I need to build not like I'm done you know like this is something that is very important and I should try harder you know like I shouldn't just like expect life to just be easy from here on out you know and and then that's when I started to really push and that's when I started to pump out artwork like even further and I started to do stuff to really build my um, my audience and build my reputation as a concept artist, which then eventually landed me the, my first big studio job uh, over at Santa, Sony Santa Monica. How long did you stay there? I was there for about a year and a half, I think. It was almost two years, closer to two years. And so <clears throat> I was there, and that, that principle that I was just talking about, you know, like how... I should keep building my career. Like, um, there's this idea of like I don't know if you have this expression in Croatia or in the listeners' like regions, but like this is expression. Uh, it's called the grass is always greener. Of course. Yeah. So, so if you're not familiar with this expression, it means that like wherever you're at, like if you're like let's say you're at your house and you look at your neighbor's lawn, you always think, oh man, their their grass is greener than my grass, and so then you try to like 
have their grass or you try to make your grass greener or whatever. It's this idea of like like nothing is as good as that. Like yeah. I don't I don't have the thing and it's better over there than it is where I'm at. And basically you're, you're as an individual you're never satisfied with, with what you Yes, with what absolutely. You have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so so when I got the Sony Santa Monica job, uh that was the first time that I actually I recognized that that was kind of like a thing. Because although like it was clearly a better job than my first real job, right? And clearly I was working with some of the most epic artists in the industry and, and I was working on a really great project. It felt almost entirely the same as the other project and other company outside of like the scale and the talent, right? Like the people that I was working with, like the caliber of artists and the project's scope. Like that was clearly different. But like it was still like I showed up, did a bunch of paintings, and then went home. You know what I mean? And that that then spawned this new principle of like, okay, this is this is what happened to me last time. You know, I got real comfortable and um, I didn't pursue anything further, right? And so I said, well, I'm just going to start to pursue stuff more. I'm going to draw more and I'm going to try a little bit harder. <clears throat> and that's at that same time, that's when I, um, I began to build um, – you know, my family too, you know, and that was when my daughter was born and Sony Santa Monica is about like a two hour drive from where I live. And I didn't like how far it was. So I was trying to find another way out. Like I was trying to find a studio closer to home and that's why I left Sony. Uh, otherwise I probably wouldn't have if I was still was pretty close, but I, but I also told myself that I need to like keep doing personal work. So even at Sony, I was doing personal work. And even when I got the new job, I got, I did personal work. I was constantly like trying to do personal work and it was like becoming more and more clear that I needed to build like a larger reputation for who I was during that, that time. Because if I want to like really, uh, build a long lasting career, I need to invest in myself. Right. And so that was like the beginning uh, of what robot pencil would, would ultimately become. So, uh, right from the start, uh, or at least like after after you know like six or months or eight or, or ten, in in uh, Sony you actually uh, started thinking about your solo career. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That didn't happen right away, right? So no, no, not at all. What 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 was the next station for uh, in your uh, uh, in your <laughs> career path? Well, yes. Yeah, so, after after Santa Monica. Yeah. So you know, from from there on out, like I just started to just build and build my audience. <clears throat> you know, I always have this um, question that's asked of me amongst my students, and it's one of my you know one of my favorite kinds of questions, and I understand why people ask it, and it's like, how did I build my audience, right, and. Uh, I always explain to them, oh, I just, you know, I, I just posted all the time, right? And, you know, a lot of people don't like to necessarily hear that, right? Because they're hoping that there's something that they're not doing right, right? They're, they're hoping that there's something that I just knew, like, early on. But the reality is I didn't really know anything. Like, I didn't know. I, it wasn't like, oh, yeah, I better just do this and then everything will work out. I had no clue, Right? I just did it. Uh, I just did what I was uh, felt natural to me, and it just ultimately ended up working. And then I was able to have hindsight, you know, be able to look backwards and see why it worked, you know, uh, instead of like, oh no, like yeah, definitely early on, I knew exactly to do this stuff. And so when I was at Sony Santa Monica, I was like, I need to keep building my portfolio because the philosophy that I had in my mind at that time was that when I got laid off of my last job, I didn't have anything to show for it, right? And if you guys ever work for a studio, which most of you guys will, and some of you guys probably already do, if you are not sharing new work on your uh, art station or on your Demian art or on your Facebook or on your Instagram or whatever the heck you use, right? <clears throat> you most likely cannot share the work you're doing professionally, right? Because it's, 
usually behind NDAs or it's just a project that just needs time before you can even share anything. In fact, I was very happy to see that a lot of my friends were able to finally say, hey, I worked at this for like four or five years at Riot because they just like unloaded all this great IPs and stuff, you know, just in the last day. But like you got to imagine like a lot of these people couldn't share anything, right? Nothing because because it's top secret, right? So imagine for like four or five years, you're like not sharing any artwork, right? I mean, you're working, you're making money. And it's great, but uh, just because Riot just announced all this project and you're now able to share all this work doesn't all of a sudden mean you have like a huge boom of fans and a huge boom of followers. It doesn't work that way, you know? And uh, what tends to work is the consistency posting. So like, let's take someone uh, to kind of derail just to kind of make my point. Like, let's take someone like Paul Kwan, who does work at Riot, right? And he did work on some of these projects. Uh, he's been sharing work consistently and constantly for years, regardless of the secrecy of what he was working on at uh, Riot. But he, it was just all personal work, right? So he was able to build a huge audience. Some of his contemporaries and peers who worked alongside him, who are just sharing what they've done for Riot now, are now going to all of a sudden have as many followers as he does. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I'm using that as an example because that's something that I know now. Right. Because at the time I didn't, I just was like, I can't just like, what if like they lay me off again? Or what if I don't have a job? Am I just going to all again, like build, rebuild a whole portfolio from scratch? Because like, I can't share anything that I worked on on this until it comes out. Right. And who knows when that's going to happen? It might happen in a year. It might happen in two years. So I'm just going to have to wait a year before I can share what I do. And so that philosophy was what um, led me to start posting all the time sharing my work all over the place and slowly but surely build an audience. And then that's when I began to really spread spread my wings and to, to really kind of um, become Robot Pencil, if you will. So, uh, okay, like not everyone working in a, in a, in a big studio uh, like is dreaming of their own uh, career. Uh, or their own projects uh, uh, so but I was definitely one of the guys who when I worked I worked in advertising but uh, uh, the same thing the I had the same problem I I didn't like what I was doing there you know uh, uh -huh. I, I didn't want to put I didn't want to put that stuff in my portfolio you know so, so I was like constantly uh, unhappy there uh, but I realized like uh, even those who want to uh, want to create something for themselves uh, in your case uh, you had a dream about robot pencil uh, mm -hmm. I had some other dreams but uh, uh, a lot of them are like really afraid to you know you know uh, just go for it because totally you know, like uh, it's, it's a lot of risk, <coughs> a lot of risk as well you know so you have to be like 100% confident you know that you might make it you know so yeah, like, and that's a, I know you had, like, a, a part of the agenda, you had some questions about, like, um, failure, right? So I'll, I'll kind of segue into that by talking about chances that I've taken and how they have failed dramatically, right? And how they affected my career. And so, so talking about taking chances, right? So during that peak of when I was working um, at Sony Santa Monica, then I left because my daughter, and then I was starting to build my audience, truly was building an audience. I was getting close to like 20,000 followers on Facebook, which at the time was a big number, right? To have like on Facebook, as a, especially as an artist, you know, not anymore, but definitely then. And I was like, you know, I think I could probably start something, you know? And so that's when I did a Kickstarter. I did a Kickstarter for a book I called Heaven's Hell. And it was really successful. It did really well on the Kickstarter, right? People were like, heck yeah, I want to buy a book like that, you know? You, you, have, opened and, the, you have opened the doors of hell now with this, uh, <laughs> with this stream. Trust, trust me, it's, it's, those, those doors have been shut a long time ago, man. Okay. Like, those doors were open, but now they're closed. Um, but let's talk about it, because I think it's important. I don't think, like, it, I, even you were, you know, behind closed doors, you were kind of like, you know, it might come up, so just be prepared. And I'm like, well, I did get, like, like I, uh, I did get a few questions, you know, when we announced this uh, stream, I did get a few questions about the book, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. But listen, like, uh, I've never really been um, afraid to talk about it. 
you know, as bad as it may have became, you know? And I think, and that's part of the story of like why it's important to build a community, right? So I'll get into all this. So, so I did the, I did the, the book and I did that and it was a huge success and people were really happy. And a lot of my, um, you know, my, uh, what you call it, my fans were really excited about it and they couldn't wait. And so when that happened, uh, I was even more vindicated that I had a real thing on my hands, like that I knew that I had value, right? That there was something valuable about what I had to put out there, you know? It, it really boosted my confidence in myself as an artist. It taught me a lot about what uh, people like about my work. It, it was a real, really powerful moment, and I honestly do not regret it happening, okay? And so and so what ended up happening is, though, as as many people may have like have deducted from just what we were talking about right a moment ago, it didn't go well, right? It ended up uh, being a huge failure, right? But I'll explain why. And so when I first started my Kickstarter, there was a few problems. One, I didn't ever distribute a book before, ever, right? I've never made an art book. I've never distributed an art book. So I was just going off of just simple Google searches and simple research of like how to do it. And I felt pretty confident that I could do it. And so as that uh, became true, I then began to, you know, uh, do the work. I started going to, uh, you know, Design Studio Press, uh, who have been nothing more supportive of helping me make the book happen. They did a lot of work to make it actually come together. And it was mostly just me. It was like I was taking on too many responsibilities at the same time. Because then I was starting to... Uh, I was just getting married and then I was having more kids and I started to realize that I needed like a job because even though the Kickstarter did really well, I still actually needed to like work, right? Because what, what ended up happening is that I thought like, well, you know, I can just kind of ride the wave of this, this Kickstarter stuff and then just start doing freelance or whatever and just begin, um, you know, making a living like from this. But obviously I learned that that's not how it works. Right. And well, I just started to neglect it. I started putting it back and started taking my time with it. You know, I was like, well, let me just get my life in order first and then I'll like get to the book, you know. And as time went on, it just started to kind of really like fall away from me. And the more time went on, the more I was just OK with it because I, I felt like nobody was really upset and nobody really cared. They were patient enough. And so I was like, oh, whatever, you know. But then there was like the first backlash that came out and they were like, hey man, the hell you doing, dude? And, and when that happened, I realized, yeah, I am totally screwing up, you know? And so then I said, okay, look, I'm going to like start putting it together, but if, you're not, if you don't wanna wait, like I'll refund you. It's not a problem, right? So then I started refunding people because clearly a lot of people were very upset and they didn't wanna wait any longer. Because at this point it was like a year into the book like or like a year and a half maybe that the book was supposed to be distributed and it just wasn't coming out so then i was like all right like i'll just kind of get this in order um and at that same time that's when i actually started like the robot pencil like like i started to really build that that school because i was working at blizzard at this time and i was like uh, i need to like find ways to kind of make this right and get on top of this and so I needed, like, I started my school, I started doing tutorials, I started doing all this stuff, which was, like, like I said, it was a very good blessing. And this is going back to why I don't have regrets. I'll explain in just a moment. But then I started to, you know, try to follow through. And I started getting the books printed, finally. I started to refund people when they were asking for them. And then I started to, you know, distribute, uh, like, or begin the distribution. But I still just had no clue on how to do all the, the, what you call it, the packages and all that stuff. So I was trying to figure that out. And, and then like another year goes by of just me like twiddling my thumbs. Like I think it was like another year or two. And then another thing happened because I began going to workshops like the IFC workshop. I started to um, begin. I was like one of the co-founders of Learn Squared, right? And I started to just do stuff. Like I started to build momentum in my career again. And I got distracted yet yet again. And then the second backlash was probably the heaviest and the hardest hitting one that ever I've ever experienced in my whole career. Right? 
and people were out for blood, you know? They were truly out for blood. And because of that, I, I realized that I needed to step down from the Learn Squared because I didn't want to taint that school because I really believed in it. And I really think it's a good group of people. And I didn't want to like, they were, they were, they were kind of upset about it. But I was like, look, let's, let's not make it hard. I'll just leave. You know, it's not a problem. Right. Like this is clearly something like, like dirty laundry that I have still yet to clean. And it's not your guys' fault at all. Right? Just, I need to, just before you continue. So like in a, in a matter of like five minutes, uh, we jump from, you know, like uh, this, uh, a romantic view of uh, you know like being an artist and uh, doing art for a living you know into something uh, which is like uh, very stressful and and problematic and it's all about uh, you know business and and money you know so i just i just wanted to stop you here because uh, it's something to expect you know if you're not to pre not prepared for you know absolutely what you want to do you know because a lot of people are dreaming about you know doing their own business but it has a lot of traps you know and absolutely I'm sure if i'm sure that if you had someone you know to advise you you know someone with experience that you know this shit wouldn't happen but yeah please continue i just wanted to yeah, yeah no that's perfect yeah. no that's a perfect interjection yeah because the romanticizing is is very valuable to help people get motivated but you also need the practicality and the reality of the problems that can come in absolutely i agree and that's why i think it, it is important i'm trying to explain all this you know because at the end there there obviously is a, a happy ending mm -hmm. and so like so towards towards that backlash it was really bad i was very upset and i was very depressed and you know but i i knew also that was a great moment in my life where i knew who my real friends were because there were some people that were like really talking behind my back and really trying to burn bridges like you know they were really trying to destroy my whole career but i had a lot of other people that were just like well look if you've ever met aj you would realize that he clearly was just stupid you know he didn't know what he was getting into but he had never intended to like be a criminal or like a crook it was just he was completely naive and he had no idea what was going on right and how to handle it he clearly mismanaged it and uh throughout the course of updates and uh me sharing progress of the book and how it was going at no point did i say that i didn't mess up i was always like yeah this is clearly like real bad, you know, and I'm really sorry and I'm trying to fix it, you know. And a lot of people understood and a lot of people didn't, you know. And the criticism, I always say, was fair. I don't think that the criticism and even some of the backlash made a lot of sense to me. Honestly, was not mad about it, that. I was more disappointed in myself, you know. There were some, obviously, that, were, that went like over the line. But there was a lot that were just like very, very critical, very clear, very concise, and it was impossible to re re refute. You know, I had clearly made a mistake. And so like for the next year or so after that backlash, I just focused on getting the books out as best I could. And I still couldn't get the, what you call it, the, the backing. And this is now over like a span of four to five years. I mean, really failing at this. And... I ultimately said, you know what, I have to move on because even though all this stuff was happening, and as you said, I'm a very optimistic person, right? And I'm very like positive. Like, even though I was failing hard, I knew that I needed to stay focused and stay positive because that's just who I am, right? Like, just focusing on why and how I suck uh, would not solve any problems, right? And so I ultimately made the final decision and said, look, there's no way that I'm going to even get back all of these, these the secondary prizes and stuff that I had promised. So here's what's going to happen. If you want the book, I'll, I'll mail you the book, you know, no problem. You just got to email me and make sure that I get your address and update it and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. <clears throat> if you don't want the book at all, 100% refund. And if you've gotten the book and you were still expecting the prizes and all the extra stuff, I'm going to give you a partial refund, meaning that whatever the book costs, we'll remove that from the total backing that you did, and then everything else I'll pay you back, you know? So, like, if you got, like, a $30 book but you paid $50, then you're going to get $20 back, you know? And I've made good on that. 
uh, and I said, look, this is just how it's going to be. There's no way I need to, I need to focus in my life because now at this point I have a third child. Right. And I'm like really building, you know, a, a real good community around my education and around like this persona. And I want people to know that when you make a mistake, you should own up to it and try your best to solve it. Even if it's really challenging, because that was very challenging. And I always tell people that I'm very grateful for, for it happening because it was at a scale that wasn't so big that I couldn't fix it. Like, imagine if I had like a million dollars from that thing, that would have been a real mess. I don't know where I would be right now. You know, it was like a large enough money, but it wasn't small. Like, it was a large enough amount that I still, it was still hard to solve the problem. You know, it wasn't really easy, but it wasn't large enough to totally destroy who I was and what I was. Right. And so I'm grateful for that. And, and like I said, a lot of people, uh, even to this day, who backed the project and, you know, were part of it, were, you know, very supportive and understanding, you know. And it's actually, they, they, those are the people that really helped me out. You know, a lot of those people were very positive and really like, look, man, we get it. We're on your side, you know. We understand it was just it was a hard sell. And, and they were saying to me, like, you know, the fact that I still would go out there and try to talk to people and help people out and still encourage people, even with that great failure behind my, like behind me, you know, um, was really endearing. And that's the kind of stuff that kept me going. You know what I mean? In fact, let me tell you a quick story and we can move on to some question or other questions and segments. But like ultimately, um, there was this one person who, when, the, when the whole controversy was happening, they were really, really angry, you know? And they even threatened to, like, that's to fight me. That's something personal? Yeah, it's very like personal. Pe people uh, you know from before? Or oh, just, no, no. This is someone this is who, random. who backed the, the book? Uh, on yeah, the some, some person that backed the book, exactly. And then they, but they attacked me personally, and they were, like, even threatening to phys be physical, you know? And I, at that point, I was like, I don't know what to say to this person, right? Like... I've already refunded them. I, I've already apologized. I don't want to fight anybody, you know? I just want to kind of put this behind me. Um, years later, this person actually wrote a really powerful and really moving email to me, uh, essentially apologizing that, that they didn't feel that the, their criticisms were unwarranted, but their, the, the rationale, like the behavior behind the response was not uh, so good, right? So, like, it's really nice to see that, like, even some of the most critical, most visceral people, uh, you know, they they were able to kind of come back around and realize that I wasn't, like, the, that that it was a misled, like, the narrative of who I was was a mis misreading of the situation, right? And um, and I think that's really important because now, uh, you know, I'm I'm just as successful, if not more successful, uh, after that whole mess, right? I'm starting to get more opportunities on like uh, on larger platforms. Uh, my classes and tutorials still do very well. You know, um, I'm currently partnering up with people that are really big names and, and big projects. You know, it's because all the stuff that I've I've tried to put behind me and people focus on kind of who I am rather than uh, all my mistakes. Because if you focus on just the mistakes to define somebody, I think that's inaccurate. Right, that's not really a, a really uh, realistic sense of sensibility. So, can I just interrupt you? Uh, like, so yeah, what, what, what was the situation now with those who didn't get either book or uh, the money? Uh, no, they did. So there's like, nobody that hasn't. So everything is sold. Yeah, there there might be like one or two people because there's some people that when they filled in their information, they like wrote their first name was like Cat. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, how am I going to find this person? Yeah. And some people have changed their emails, so they didn't even check their old emails. So I've made that like long-lasting post on my uh, my Kickstarter saying, look, if you still haven't got either of these things, just message me. So, and as far as I'm concerned, there there isn't anyone we haven't addressed. I ask because like uh, even now when announcing this talk with you, I had to do some answering you know to to some people uh about uh, this uh, book thing and i mean it's uh it's important to mention this because uh for those who are interested in running 
their art, uh, uh, you know, like uh, um, to, uh, in, in other words, to to make business of their art, uh, is like like one one bad decision in life, you know, can really you know affect uh, absolutely the rest of it a lot. So and uh, so people still ask questions you know people still see like uh, you know people don't know even people who, ha- who haven't backed you uh, haven't backed the book uh, don't they are not aware of the fact that that's like this thing is a history now you know they're still like uh, asking these questions and uh, uh, and i said like I, I answered to a person and i guess that person is like listening now but uh, just yesterday i was exchanging messages you know and I said, like, uh, the reason why I uh, support people like AJ is because, like, uh, with his other activities, he's constantly trying to make a difference. And with his influence, he affected, like, uh, lives of, 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 of so many, uh, you know, younger artists, you know, and even older guys who are, like, who are looking for motivation. And in the good way, and these were your, like, intentions. And then along the way, you screw some people unintentionally you know and uh, it's funny how you know people will always be louder about uh, bad stuff that you did you know than about the good stuff that you did and but that's that's how things are that's how people yeah. are so there's there's going to be there's definitely going to be some people that i know for a fact that just will never will never forgive right and and that's fine there's nothing i can do about that right and i I will say to those those people, and especially if you're listening and you were one of those backers that have yet to receive your book a refund, you, all you really got to do is just email me uh, on my website, and then you'll get it. It's not it's not gonna ha- it's not a problem. And so, like I tell people this, like because because some of the people, like I said, they've changed their either they changed their email and they don't use that email anymore, or they just haven't read that latest update. Um, you just gotta just check in. You know, like uh, that's part of the problem of what I had going was that I didn't manage any of that stuff very well. So, so you when, know? when was the end of the story? When, 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 oh, like when, about like a year or so ago. Yeah. It was a while ago. I remember, yeah. like uh, right after you 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 came to to IFCC for the second time. Right when you left, I got into like a Facebook comment fight, you know, with some people uh, about you. Sorry and, about that. <laughs> about you and Danny. And uh, yeah. you know those guys, and uh, I was like, I mean, I shouldn't probably even you know comment it because, but I, I don't know how to shut up, you know. So I was like, the, the the my problem in all this situation because I mean, I don't know you personally that well, you know. Maybe maybe you're like lying all the time. I don't know, like. But the point is, uh, why I was fru- <laughs> I was why I was frustrated is like with all the things all the bad things that are happening every day around us and stuff that we see in news, you know, Mm -hmm. I was like, why is everyone so electrified about a thing that costs, I don't know, like $30 or $50, like, you know, with all the shit that's going on, you know, like with all the wars, with all the hunger, with all the, I don't know, like uh, even, even, you know, you, you, you probably monthly pay like additional fees for something good that's in some contract, you know, like with a, I don't know, like internet uh, provider or, or whatever that you don't, you know, know about, you know, and wh- why, did, why do people want to, you know, like hang someone, you know, this was, this was like a problematic for me to understand, you know, like, like, yeah, sure. you know, why are acting like, this you know like these little little creatures who want to bite you know because of the <laughs> well listen yeah I, I like I said I do think that a lot of the criticism was fair the only time that I felt that it was a little over the over the top was when people tried to to destroy my career and when people attacked me personally yeah, I mean you were I, guilty I think it, it was your I mean you, absolutely you, you were guilty so you should answer for it but you know absolutely Okay. That's what I'm saying. Like I was not, I was not, uh, I, I never disagreed with a lot of the criticism. In fact, I understood it, you know, and that's why, uh, that's why I'm always saying like, I think it's, and here's kind of like the moral. I want to make sure that a lot of the listeners understand, right? Like it's important that people focus on what your intent was, right? And then what also is very important is that when you're when you face these failures like how are you ever going to improve if you don't realize that you've done something wrong 
right? Because because of this, I've tried to do better about what I do, you know? And I still have made mistakes and I have still have some failures under my belt, even after all that. But, you know, one of the things that I teach my students, because a lot of times this is a problem for them, is that they're afraid to even make that first failure, right? They're afraid of like painting something wrong because it might be garbage. They're afraid of like uh, doing something, you know, for whatever reason, because they're afraid of that huge failure. And I say to them, like, you got to try, you know, and as long as you, you keep the, the intention good, right? Like if your intention was not to, you know, scam people or your intention was to try to become a better artist or your intention is to try to get a, a career or start your, uh, your IP or whatever the thing is for based off of good intentions. And if you make a mistake and if you fail, as long as those intentions are still valid, right, then it should drive how you react to your failure and it will make you grow. Like if you look at some of the greatest, um, you know, the greatest minds, like this is, there is this book called Mastery. You guys should listen to it. It's a really good book. And that whole book is essentially about people's failures, like how all these great leaders and uh, thinkers failed a lot. And some of them were even in the scale of failure much larger than mine, right? I mean, if you look at someone like Steve Jobs who literally lost his whole company, right, entirely, you know? And if you look at people like Benjamin Franklin who like moved to a whole different country and then lost everything, right? And it was like a huge, huge failure. Like he was, he made such a monumental mistake. And the, the book constantly goes through all of these people. And that book really helped me get through a lot of what was going on, right? Uh, and it demonstrates that failure is kind of the part of succeed, like succeeding. And I think if you're not even um, attempting something, then you will almost always, like default setting will be that you've already failed, right? And I think if your intentions are good and you, you lead with your intentions, then uh, you, will, you will overcome it, whatever those are. Obviously, I think that there are some failures that might be impossible to redeem yourself from, Right? Like there's obviously some things that are just really traumatic and really devastating that it's it's hard for me to say, well, you can overcome that. Like if you're like a serial murderer, that's that's the kind of a different type of failure, right? But like, you know, being a failed Kickstarter, that is a redeemable failure, in my opinion, right? I'm not the only one. There's many other people who have had failed Kickstarters, but that also have redeemed themselves, you know? Of course. Of course. Uh, we have a question from Andy Walsh. Uh, he said, yeah, man. Uh, Good old Andy. What's up, Andy? Uh, there are few, very few concept art jobs out there, and of the jobs available, most ask for senior lead concept art roles. How do you Got start it. a career when there's very little entry level avenues? I, I say that because earlier you said that most of us will get a job in a studio. I'm close to giving mm -hmm. up on concept art as a, a career path after eight years. Uh, okay, uh, before you answer, I'll just add, uh, like, uh, we'll also talk about something, uh, uh, about, about things, alternative ways of making money from your art. So, uh, sure. working in a studio is not the only option. So, yeah, please answer now. Got it. Uh, yeah. So, that, that, uh, that, that question, and I, I've talked to Andy before, um, that question is, is understandable. But the, the reality is that it, there is actually quite a lot of entry-level jobs, you know. Um, and I won't lie, though. Like, if depending on where you're at and where you live, it is going to be more challenging. I'm not going to say that, like, oh, yeah, if you uh, want a concept art job and you're, like, living in, like, a, a country that's going through some turmoil, like Syria, that it's, like, possible for you, right? Like, I get it. There's going to be a challenge depending on where you're at. But a few things usually need to be true for me to kind of To, to feel like you have a lot more of an opportunity. One, you have access to the internet, which it seems like you do, right? Because you're responding to a channel where we're talking about this type of stuff. You got to know that the career even exists, which again, you do know, right? Um, and you have to have access to, to the right, right resources that are found on the internet, like ArtStation. And uh, there's a website called Glassdoor, for instance. It's really good. But there's there might be international equivalents. And, you know, there's stuff like what uh, Marco's even doing, like building a platform for clients to look for artists easier, you know? Like, <clears throat> like things are actually becoming easier to get a job, right, in terms of uh, uh, ease of access, right, the access part of it. Um, but 
the reality is true when I was starting out, and it's still true today. Those jobs are still available, not uh, not because they don't want entry level people. They want really good people, really great artists, you know. And I've known too many people who literally had no career outside of concept, like like I'm sorry, outside of like a first studio job. You know what I mean? Like they never worked. They never worked in their life at like a real studio. They just went from college to getting a job, right? Like at major studios. I know too many for for that not to be true. That it's like you you can only get an entry job before you can move up. That's how I did it. But I know, like I said, I know many people that have skipped that line altogether. And one thing that they all had in common. Um, or actually a couple of things that they had in common. The first one is that they were all incredibly good. You know, they were undeniably good, right? In fact, I had many students and friends of mine that would come up to me and they had the same problem. They had the same question. And I said, and I looked at their work and it was either their work was not good enough, right? I remember I had I sat down with my friend. He has been working at this for four years. And I said, your work's just not good enough. That's why you're not getting jobs. And I told him that. And I said, and you've been telling me this and that and that and this. And you're giving me all these reasons why it's hard to get a job, right? And I was like, no, it's pretty clear. You're just not good enough to work at these larger studios. And he took that very seriously. And then he just started really working at it. And then I, uh, the second variable that I always say that people had in common, they, they connected themselves with the right people at the right time, you know? In fact, that's the only thing you can control, right? You can only control the quality of your work and the people that you connect with. If nobody knows you exist, it's going to be harder for you to get opportunities. Absolutely. This is why I think that it's good to mention that if, if you can, if you can afford it, uh, go at least like at least to one or two conferences a year, uh, art conferences, because there you can like really talk to, you know, uh, colleagues, but also those who can give you jobs, you know, in person. And it's, it's, it's way different when you talk to someone live. Uh, compared when you like emailing or or chatting so absolutely no totally in fact the the first part of my career like i think 90 percent of it right like the 90 percent of the opportunities that i got in my career were um through friends or people that i met in real life but i but i will say this like i know that some people have a harder time getting access to these things even still but i'm saying like that that barrier is starting to close that gap because you know you are starting to have more online events more uh access to like online uh, opportunities that are just there you're just gonna have to work even harder to find those opportunities you know what i mean uh, and it's also hard i mean there there's never been that many uh good artists i mean uh, the tools today but also uh, the the resources to learn stuff, you know, even robot pencil and other uh, channels, uh, people are just getting better and better, and there are like more and more of them. And the question is, are there enough free seats in companies for for all those amazing artists? Yeah, there is. I mean, I literally, um, I'm trying to tell you, like, I literally know of places that are constantly looking for concept artists, constantly, right? And the jobs are coming to people like me and those artists that you're talking about. And we can't take all those jobs, right? And a lot of people, like you mentioned, these people that are extraordinarily good are probably already working. You know what I mean? Uh, I have a friend who was really, really good. Uh, he was a student of mine too. And I told him, I was like, your problem is that you don't share your work often enough. And he shared his work more often and then he started getting more opportunities. I mean, there's a very clear connection, and then we can kind of go back to the, the other sources of income, because. Mm -hmm. But because... I, I would like to stick to this now, because okay, we're jumping okay. Uh, back and forth uh, through the topics, uh, but uh, since we started already talking about uh, you know like posting your stuff and that kind of thing and and those things, uh, mm -hmm. can we like uh, okay, can we talk about some numbers like how often to post? Where to post? Where do you oh, post sure. your stuff? I mean, of so, course, someone who's already who's starting now can't compare with you because you already have this, you know, uh, you're already an art brand, you know, so it's not the same. But uh, it is what, the same. But what would you and, suggest, like, for someone who? Is yeah, it is the same because I'm trying to explain that I wasn't always an art brand. Of course, <laughs> but, but I'm saying now you are, you know. But well, okay, okay, so it's kind of like saying the chick 
chicken before the egg, right? Like yeah. I'm trying to say that I was an egg, you know? And, uh, and what I did is literally nothing different. It's just nobody wants to admit this. In fact, one of my classes, uh, my student told me this too. They're like, well, it's easier for you. You're already established. And I said, well, how do you think I got established? I'm trying to tell you exactly how I got established. What they're, what they're focusing on is the exponential part of it, right? Where I'm at now, because it becomes exponential. You're absolutely right, right? But it wasn't exponential. And then uh, recently I had a student ask me the same kind of question. And she was talking about how one artist, like what they did to become very popular. And she's like, is that what uh, I need to do? And I was like, uh, let's go do some research. So we went to her Instagram. And I was like, here's what I like to do whenever I find people that are very popular or do really well. Uh, I try to get to the bottom, like try to find the bottom of their Instagram, right? And see how long they've been doing it and what the bottom is. And as soon as I do that, almost always my students are like, oh, yeah, clearly I see what's going on here. This person has posted thousands of posts over several years, you know? And and I go to my students' Instagram and I say, well, you've not done that, right? And that's the difference. That is That is what has happened. Right. And I said, this person is not wrong, though. Like what they the advice that they gave, I think, is valid because I'm looking at this and I can see what they're saying and what they are getting at. But there's also something that's also true is that they've been posting literally uh, they post twice as much as I have done, you know, um, uh, on their Instagram and they have twice as many followers. You know, it seems pretty consistent. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some artwork that does way better than others. Right. Like if you post very fan art type stuff or very, you know, um, you know, um, modern type looking stuff, contemporary stuff, people, people tend to draw all themselves to that very easily, you know, like more audiences. But if you if you still look at the numbers, a lot of these people post constantly. Well, you know, a good friend of mine, uh, Ross Tran, he's a he's a he's a basically influencer like extravaganza, you know, he's like a yeah, he's professional like, influence. He's really yeah, like he, an art celebrity on Instagram. Absolutely. And so he's, he's almost gotten a million on Instagram and he's already got a million on YouTube, right? <clears throat> but again, like see how many posts he's done. Look how many videos he's put out. Look how many places he's gone, you know? It's not like he just showed up and just started kicking butt, right? Like he just started getting a million followers. It just took time. I think it took him almost four years. Right. And that's the part that people don't recognize. They they recognize that when they share something, it only gets 10 likes, but they don't recognize that somebody has been sharing their work for years to get to the thousands of likes. Right. And and when people focus on I have artwork that I believe is just as good as someone else. Why am I not get that that many artists or that, that much of a response? That's the wrong attitude. You know, you're you're not going to just explode. Remember how I mentioned earlier about all of these new stuff that Riot has just released and all of my peers are now like sharing what they've done or what they're working on, or at least just by showing the videos that have been officially released, you know, that helps. They're going to get like maybe a couple hundred followers from that, but that's it. They're not going to get tens of thousands, right? <clears throat> that's not how it works, right? And so when people uh, feel like they have to just hit the lottery, um, it's it's not a good strategy, you know. It just isn't a good one, and it's not a practical one. And I always encourage people should post. And you were asking numbers. I encourage people to post at least two or three times a week if they can. And usually the 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 question or the rebuttal to that is, well, what if my work's not good? It's not about being good. It's about building a better habit of just posting often, right? Being good will eventually actually come, you know, if you're not already good. Because that's what happened to me. I was really garbage uh, when I first started posting. And I used to post a lot on a blog, right? I used to post like every other day on a blog. But again, I didn't do that because I uh, had this foresight. I did it uh, because I just was constantly trying to get better. And then, and then now I have hindsight. I can look back at that and be able to recognize that's why it worked out and then see evidence of it everywhere. And so to kind of get back to, to Andy's uh, question and just give him a really solid direct answer to, to him specifically, right? And anyone else who feels similar in his position. My my point to you is that you you gotta like post more often. 
even if it's just sketches, even if it's just kind of doodles and noodles, everyone saw, and then you should post more professional, more qualitative artwork, uh, at least once a week, right? Something like on our, on your art station, for instance. But if you look at any of the people that do what you want to do, that are very successful, they'll either have two of these things true. They'll have high quality or uh, quantity of work, you know? And there's no denying this. You, you can look for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. Like you could just go to ArtStation, pick your favorite artist, and you'll see one of these two things. Uh, and this is why they got that job versus you. And it's, it's, really, it's, really, um, it's really easy to just look at the, the advertisements of jobs and saying all the requirements and just saying, well, I don't, written, I don't have those years of experience. I don't have this and that. It's easier to focus on that rather than potentially like uh, the, the quality of your work. But I, I remember seeing, I think I remember seeing your work and I don't think it's a quality problem, to be honest. I think it was the quantitative part, like the, the lack of posting often. You're talking about uh, Andy's uh, work. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I've just opened his art station, and uh, it's pretty. It's amazing portfolio. So. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. I said, it's either one of those things are probably the problem. It's, if it's not the quality, then it must be the quantity, right? Uh, let's let's go uh, let's go and jump a bit uh, on the topic. Yeah, of, let's do it. Uh, of marketing, and. Sure. Uh, my personal opinion on this is, and this is also related to what I said before, like there are a lot of good artists out there now and uh, most of them are on our station website. Uh, but what I always suggest to people who come to our events, you know, uh, our station is the best place to have portfolio displayed, definitely. And I also suggest like those who can to, to get a pro version as well. Uh, but what I also say to people is uh, create your own website or at least uh, start building your personal mailing list uh, because on the long run uh, it's because like when you have a mailing list uh, it's yours you know you're not tied to you know like Instagram or Facebook or whatever uh, uh, of course most of the time, it's something that you would pay for additionally, but uh, uh, you, you you won't lose it. You know, someone you know, Instagram can delete your account, or Facebook can do the same. It's not it's not that it's happening often, but you know, it can happen. Uh, my personal belief is that you should you know have a personal website as well with a mailing list with a like newsletter form where people can enter their email address and name. Uh, and also use the email marketing as a way to inform people who are interested in what you're doing, you know, also maybe once a month. So w w what's your view on that? No, I agree with you. <clears throat> so this, this is going in outside of what we were. So the earlier kind of answer that I was giving was mostly driven towards um, uh, working for studio, right? The, the one that you're talking about, like with mailing lists and personal websites, that that's a, a thing if you want to build your own platform of whatever you want, right? And they they can go in tandem. For instance, like you can work at a I, studio I, I, and I, I, I you can work. That, I believe that's also good for for individuals. I, I'm not saying that like only if you're uh, having uh, like building a platform. I think like you, uh, and and this is what I wanted to say to Andy. Like maybe you know like wor working for a big studio is not actually the only option you have. You know, I mean, it's okay if you're like strict about being a game artist and you want to be a game artist and okay that's fine but you know maybe your art can be used for other purposes as well maybe you're like can become like a really successful uh you know like cd cover guy you know or uh, uh you know like not a cd cover but you know, like you know what i'm saying like uh, uh music covers uh, maybe you know for example uh, there's a there's a Spanish artist you know who was like very popular at the at the IFCC and uh, most of most of the jobs that he gets are not from video games you know uh, a video game company will maybe hire him to do some uh, you know cover art or something like that but uh, he, he's not doing concerts for games but he's like super mm -hmm. he's super successful you know so you know it's also there's also an option for you to you know do some other artistic stuff for 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 money you know so yeah <clears throat> yeah i think yeah like when i uh saying platform 
Uh, it, it could mean that too. I'm not necessarily like build like a whole school or something like yeah. this. I'm saying like it could be exactly what you said. I agree with that. It's 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 like if you don't necessarily care about doing your own thingy, right? Like if you don't want to really build like on that, you just want to work and have a studio job because there's nothing entirely wrong with that either. You just got to understand the challenges of that, right? And what I think Marco is saying, and I kind of agree with, is that if you want to like just build like a larger brand around who you are. Uh, you might not necessarily get that gaming job, but you might get other kinds of opportunities, you know? And uh, I personally have, that doesn't necessarily uh, work so much um, for what I do, right? Because I do just post artwork of, that's mostly concept art. So I get mostly concept art jobs, but I do brand myself as a person who does this type of stuff and I do it often, right? And that's why I keep getting jobs like that, you know? And... I think that even recently, because my uh, Instagram is starting to get at a higher capacity, I'm reaching that, that influencer level, and I wasn't necessarily aiming for that. It's just the nature of what happens when you post a lot. More people will follow you consistently, right? Like, I average between, like, and here's the thing, man. Like, the more I post, the more people follow me. It's just how it works. So, like, the last week, because I, I was bedridden, I was just painting a lot, and I've been posting a lot. Right, and I got I gained like an extra like thousand to two thousand followers in a span of like a week and a half, right? Uh, versus before when I just left my Instagram a little stagnant and posted like once or once or twice a week, uh, it was like a couple hundred, right? So it's very clear correlation, you know. It's not like um, it's not a mystery to me is what I'm getting at, you know. Uh, in fact, that same correlation applies to my classes and to my tutorials. My tutorials sell more and my classes fill out faster. It's just how it works. If I don't post often, which there's there's occasions where that, that happens, right, where I just don't do anything for whatever reason. Maybe I'm like learning programming or maybe I'm like you know spending more time with my friends and family. Who knows, right? But whatever the reason is that pre prevents me from posting often as I usually do, guess what? My numbers stay low. And they, they drop off pretty pretty fast. Uh, I don't worry about this stuff because I will ultimately still post often, you know? But I know that that's the reason why these numbers go up and down. And for someone who's just starting out, those numbers are going to be much sm smaller. But there's something called compound interest where it it's basically just keeps adding up, right? So, for instance, 1 plus 1 equals 2. 2 plus 2 equals 4. 4 plus 4 equals 8, and you keep doing that, right? And the numbers will still stay low. They're still, like, in the low hundreds. But if you keep that up in a long period of time, they start getting to the thousands. And then the thousands add up to millions, you know? And so that's the way that uh, I look at it. You know, a lot of times when people are starting out, they, they're they looking for, like, um, quicker gains, right? Like something that happened almost immediately. And I, I'm trying to tell you, that's not a sustainable model, you know? Because then you're constantly uh, at arms with your numbers. You're always looking at them and feeling like, oh, man, nobody's following my work, whatever. But the reality is that, no, yeah, you should just be posting more often. And I assure you, like every time I've given this advice to people who I feel have good work, right, they tend to all of a sudden start to succeed, you know? They start to tend to get more followers. They start to tend to get more people approaching them. There was a really great artist... Um, I'll, I'll keep him, I'll keep all these artists nameless because I haven't asked permission to, to talk about their success stories. But like, but I, I have like a message. I remember I shared with another student uh, privately where he had the same issue. He was a really good artist, and I looked at his portfolio and I said, "There's no reason why you shouldn't be working." And then I um, looked at his consistency of posts, and it was very clear to me. And I told him the same thing I'm telling you guys. And he posted often, and then sure enough, like a year later, he messaged me, and he was like, that advice really helped out, because now I'm in perpetual work, you know? And but I'm not also, saying that... Uh, I mean, uh, it's also important to be consistent about, like, what you're posting. I mean, it, it has to be... If you're aiming in the particular type of job, it has to be, uh, you know, yeah, at least that's great. build the style or... Or no, that's whatever. that's perfect too. I I'm, agree. With I this. myself, I post like images of my kids, and then I post like my cats, and then I post a bit of art, and then you know, and that's yeah, not, no, that's, that's not, the way, that's that's not the way to do it. 
<laughs> no, that's perfect. Um, in fact, remember I mentioned earlier there was a female student that was talking about how we were, we were doing the research together and we were looking at this artist that she was talking about. The advice this artist gave to to the audience at the time was that sh uh, when she started building like this comic, that's when the numbers started like stacking up. And that's what my student thought. I was like, well, is it the fact that I'm not focused, you know? Because she was saying that as soon as she focused, like it started working out. And when we looked at her Instagram and we did the research together, uh, I said, yeah, if you look at her first like few hundred posts, they were like very much what you said. Like they're like all over the place, like pictures of her cat then pictures of like her, then sometimes artwork. And sometimes they were just really rough sketches and sometimes they weren't. It was like all over the place. Right. Um, but then when she started doing this comic, she just started posting everything about that comic and that constant posting of that thing built who she was. And that's another thing you guys can do is you can you can go to your your favorite people on art station and look at like some of these great artists that you admire and just look at their like body of work like look at the whole picture like look at all the stuff they've done and there's usually a very clear consistency to what Marco was saying and that goes back to the idea of like you're only going to get better and better at doing whatever you do don't get me wrong I'm not saying that this is easy I'm not saying that if you um, um, do this today, you're going to get a job tomorrow. I'm saying that it is it is something that is within reach more so than you guys might think. You know, I understand this this sense of dread and this ex existential sense of like getting a career in this this industry. But I, I'm trying to say, like, trust me, the the industry is constantly trying to hire badass artists. You know, there this there's actually not as many as you think. You know, and just as much as like you're saying there's more artists that are capable of doing great work, there's also more companies that are spawning because the tools are easier to make a video game now, you know? And so so more and more people, like think about like the guys who made PUBG, right? It was just like a small team of people. And now they're like a huge corporation, right? Same with Riot. And more of those types of things are starting to happen as well. And more more opportunities, like I have artist friends who are now making their own video games by themselves. You know, there's there's all of a sudden uh, not only just like, yeah, sure, more competition, but there's also more ways to make media, you know, and more people making media that are going to constantly be looking for uh, people to help them make this awesome media. I'll just interrupt you for a second. Uh, I've seen that like a few, like what, maybe 20 minutes ago, uh, modern day, day James uh, joined and uh, left a few messages and I'm trying to get in touch with this guy. And so if anyone knows him, just tell him, you know, that... Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, okay, then... You he used to be one of my students. <laughs> then get me in touch with him uh, okay. after the show. Uh, yeah, modern, okay. uh, James is great. Yeah, yeah. I, I love his videos. Uh, so uh, let's talk about... Uh, let's do a bit of jumping, uh, a bit more of jumping uh, to topics... Uh, clients and uh, I would like to discuss like uh, some bad practices and good practices when you know uh, working with clients you know so uh, yeah. I don't want to I, I, I don't want to go I don't want to be very specific about it but uh, uh, can you tell me something from your own experience like what were the bad experiences and why did they happen and how do you do fix it later on you know? <laughs> So the, the bad experience is just miscommu uh, miscommunication, right? Like I've worked with clients where the miscommunication was bad on either my side or on their side or on both, right? And so the ways that I've fixed that is just I've just got better as an artist and I make sure if I don't know what's going on to let them know that I don't know what's going on, right? So let me give you, give you a good example. So when I used to work with this one client, uh, and it went badly. So this this was a job that I ultimately ended up losing, right? They were expecting a certain quality and certain type of sketch from me, and I was providing it, but it just was uh, not hitting the mark. And instead of you know being more clear and instead of uh, talking to them more thoroughly about it, I just kept on trying to, to figure it out. And you know, these, this this person wasn't them. They themselves weren't like an artist. In fact, most people you work with who give you direction aren't artists. That's why you're hired, right? So if you expect like the people that you work with are like illiterate, like very literate when it comes to 
explaining to you exactly why you failed, right, or why you're off the mark, uh, be rudely awakened. You know that is not the case. And so I realized that very early on, early on in my career. And so the way that I combat that now is to provide very clear sketches. You know, so like when they ask me, "Hey, we want you to design some sort of like demon thingy," I draw demon things that are very clear and then i draw a lot of them so they have options to pick from you know what i mean no. what the <laughs> you just throw your alarm no, um, my wife is calling so i have to ignore her i hope she's not listening to the stream <laughs> <laughs> so you know being more clear with my designs was one of the biggest things and delivering um punctually right and and then then that way, like if they found something wrong with it or they didn't like what I provided or whatever, which can happen, uh, which should happen, right? If you're, if you're working with somebody, it's not going to always be a hundred percent on the mark. Right. Um, then they'll give you uh, a little bit more specific feedback because if you drew like seven horns and it's very clearly horns and it's very obvious, then they're like, oh, that's too many horns. Or like maybe you drew a texture that looks like metallic and is very clearly the metallic. And they're like, oh, we don't want that to be metallic. Like you give them an opportunity to use vocabulary that's very clear for you to work with, right? As well as they have an opportunity to actually feel like they have ability to give you feedback. Um, and then and then if that still doesn't work, like let's say I do something and they just like, oh, there's, there's just something wrong with it. I don't know what it is, right? And this is this is usually a good position because that means that they do like what you've submitted, right? But they still feel like something is missing. They just can't explain it very clearly, you know. That's just the nature of um, of working with people, right? That aren't necessarily artists. So then you you should preemptively then ask them, can you provide me like like some references, like reference uh, images, right? That I could um, be inspired by you know, or that you can inspire me with. And that usually goes much better, right? And then they'll provide you images that you can try to like lean on to. Um, but that's usually like some of the, the things that I ran into. That's probably like the the thing that I think a lot of people don't do uh, as well. Like the, the client, um, the client relationship is not strong in terms of communication. Uh, in terms of other stuff, I think another mistake that people make early on, uh, which is pretty common, is that they undervalue their work. You should you should definitely value work much higher because uh, you got to realize that what you do is hard to do, even if it's at a very low level, right? Compared to some of you your art heroes that exist, I'm sure you know who they are, and you'd be like, "Well, that person should deserve this rate. I don't deserve it." You know, uh, you'd be surprised. The rate is actually much higher. And then even for junior level artists, I think somewhere around like sixty to seventy thousand dollars U.S. dollars. Uh, I'm not sure where you are in in what regions, how much that means to you, because like in California, that's still not a lot of money. But generally speaking, you can look around like seventy to eighty k U.S. dollars for an entry level concept art job is pretty reasonable, because especially if you're decent, if you feel like you're very very new. You should still be asking for like somewhere closer to fifty thousand dollars in terms of salary. If you don't know what that is hourly, just just do the math, right? Just do all the the long division. So if you need to do hourly rates, or if you need to do flat rates, like if someone's like, "Hey, we want you to work on this project, and we want you to provide a flat rate," then just calculate how many hours you're going to work. Calculate how much you think that would uh, cost under a fifty thousand, sixty thousand dollars salary, right? And then just tell them that number. Include like how much it would be to do revisions, how long it would take to 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 finish the paintings, you know, uh, to do sketches in between, you know, like include all of that time when you do your flat rate. So, for instance, let's say somebody says, "I want you to do five character designs," right? Well, hey, we want you to do five character designs, and you think it's going to take you like fifteen hours to do uh, each of them, right? Put that in, calculate that, right? And then figure out what your hourly hourly rate is. Like let's say it's fifty dollars an hour or something like this. Then times that by fifty, you know. And then just tell them that that's your flat rate. Because if you don't do that, and you say, "Yeah, I'll do it for whatever," and they're like, "All right, can you do five characters for five five hundred dollars?" Which is sometimes the case. 
Now think about how much work you like. If it still takes you 15 hours to do each of those characters at a $500 price point, you actually will be making more money working at McDonald's than to um, do concept art for these people, right? And if you think about that, uh, to work at McDonald's doesn't take as much of a prerequisite, right? Uh, than it does to be a concept artist on a project. So, so if you're really, a, if it's really about the making the money, then just take that McDonald's job, right? Because at least they'll pay you fairly for the the work that you're doing. And so, but if it's not a money thing, and you're thinking, well, I, I want to do it for exposure, uh, exposure only works if you are working for very, very large companies. But even then, they usually pay you for your time, you know. And um, and people that will say that they'll share your work for exposure. I mean, it's like a meme at this point. You know, people understand that that's kind of a joke. Um, like, you don't need to be dismissive to them. You know, you can just say, no, I don't want to take the job. But here's my rate if you change your mind, right? And, and I, in fact, this still happens for me, like, very rarely. But it still happens. And every time it does, I always explain to them that, you know, you, you're going to be hard-pressed to get somebody to work for you uh, just for free. So be very cautious, you know? when you're reaching out to other artists and it might be in your best interest to even just pay them for, let's say a few hours at a time, you know, it might be cheaper, like a couple hundred dollars. Right. So, and it can give you a nice sketch, but don't expect them to do like a whole thing for like, the, like a whole project for like five bucks or for free. You know, the thing is like on the Eastern European markets, you know, like the Balkan area where I am or Turkey uh, or, you know, you go to the, to the market and then, uh, you know, there's a price, you know, and then you give your price and then the seller gives his price, you know, and then you both find uh, the appropriate price for, you know, in this case for your service. Uh, I also think that uh, it's much better. Uh, first of all, it's much better to discuss money uh, right in front. Uh, I know I right got, away. Yeah, I, I got screwed so many times when I was younger, you know, uh, totally me too, because, you know, like I'll discuss money later. Uh, one other thing for the, for those of you, if you guys have like your own website, uh, and this is something that we uh, do that I do like with my clients, uh, there's a very, very effective way, you know, of, uh, you know, finding out what uh, the client actually wants. I mean, it depends like, if you're like a freelancer who, who works like solely on some project, then it's easier to do this uh, than uh, if you're in theme, a uh, team, but uh, uh, the, you, you can build like a, a contact form, like with all the uh, questions, you know, uh, like uh, basic questions about some project, you know, like for example, uh, what, what do you need? Like, uh, uh, is it a film? Is it a game? Uh, can you describe it to me? Uh, what's the what's the deadline and that kind of stuff and this initial information can tell you a lot about how much time will you uh, have to invest in this job you know it will help you to you know uh, think about what would be appropriate price you know I myself I always uh, suggest everyone that uh, they charge like an, uh, a daily rate because it works best for me but it doesn't work best for everyone so so I mean, these are some topics that, you know, could be discussed further. And I just I'm just dropping it here so uh, we can talk about it today or some other time uh, during some other session. Uh, <clears throat> just let me check uh, about uh, what we have covered and what we haven't covered. Uh, OK. Uh, OK, we talked about fails. Uh, <laughs> with the book totally. <laughs> no need to go into that again uh, tell me something uh, do you have your own uh, per, per, some other personal projects you know uh, you know you, you had the book back then but are you planning on something else uh, I mean will you ever come back to a Kickstarter or oh sure so um, right now I am just focused on just being a better artist uh, I was doing a lot of different things, but I realized, you know, I should probably just focus on the skill that I already got and just really double down on it, you know? I, I did this thing in Japan. It was like a speed painting competition, and, and I won. It was great. And it really kind of reinvigorated my my inspiration to be an artist. Did that like, like a few, really, few months ago? Yeah, it was earlier this year. And so I was, I was very, very motivated and inspired, you know? And... 
uh, I'm always trying to find ways that could help other artists. And so I really believe in this kind of competition. I think it's a lot of fun. It's really nerve wracking, but it's something that I think is a great way to kind of like, it could be a thing. It could be like a sport of some sort, right? Like people look at um, arts and think they can't be, but it totally can be, right? If you do it right. And, and I think it's kind of sport that is fascinating. I think people can get behind and be really interested in it. You know, like even people that are not non-artists, they can understand and respect. Just like when you see a really uh, awesome singer, right? <clears throat> you might not be able to sing well, but you understand the value of what they're singing and how they're singing it. You can respect it. And I feel the same is true with like art, you know? And so I would like to bring more light to that, you know? And so that I feel like if I can kind of just double down and just be like a full on, like, you know, art, art, um, artists like try to be a master level try to get really beyond my own skill sets you know that i i've acquired already that it, it'll do more good like in the world in general right to help people out so i'm really only focusing on that uh, but i did learn like programming and game development and the reason why i learned all that stuff is so i can like make games and then like show people how to do it too so that they can have more opportunities um to do that themselves you know become game developers and because I'm all about trying to figure out how to make things easier for people in terms of trying to get a career, right? Um, but like I said, I still probably will learn programming or still keep learning it because I do like it now and I'm starting to get pretty good at it. But ultimately, uh, I'm going to still focus on just art and just keep teaching and keep expanding the teachings, start to do more videos, start to do more tutorials, start to do more mentorships and just be able to help people more in that capacity and double down on that until one day I'm like some old hermit that lives in the mountains that you have to travel like to the Himalayas to get lessons from me. And I'm like this old white beard man, you know, like I want to, that's kind of like where I'm leading towards now. And, um, more to your, well, Asi to your Asian roots. Yeah. Go back to my Asian roots. <laughs> Just like live in the mountains of Seoul. How, how, old, like, are, how old are you? Uh, I'm 35 now. 35. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, and just build build off of that. Uh, and in terms of doing another Kickstarter, uh, I don't think I will. Uh, and I don't think necessarily that because Kickstarter is terrible. Uh, I do see a lot of failure there. Uh, and I can see how the model is not the greatest, right? Because a lot of people like me who are just total scrubs can just get money easily like that, right? I think that's there's some flaw behind that logic. I don't know if they've changed their policies or changed their their ability to like let people on there right uh but regardless what i've learned about it is that like don't do anything you don't know how to do right and don't ask for money unless uh you know how to do the thing that you're doing right and so when i started doing tutorials for instance that to me felt like a very uh honest transaction right versus the the book and i prefer that over anything you know and that if i uh, would sell or make another art book, I would do it by myself and the book and everything would already be ready to go. And I'm probably going to keep it uh, domestic um, until I really build a better uh, distribution because that was one of the main things that destroyed me was the international distribution because sometimes it was like 20 bucks to distribute overseas. Sometimes it was $150 and that miscalculation was really the kind of the the, the part that I was really naive about, you know? And, um, and I have friends who've, who've distributed physical projects, uh, products too, overseas, and they were sympathizing with this too. They were, when, when all that stuff was going on, they actually messaged me like, if you need any help on like where the resources are at, uh, here's what you should do, um, you know? Because just because I just didn't know any better. I was completely idiotic. And so uh, I would not do it because... Uh, like the whole like you know uh, crowdfunding specifically because of that, but if you are interested in it, I don't want to necessarily discount the value of it because some people have done really well and succeeded very 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 well in there. Uh, I think you need to consider a couple things. One, do you know what you're doing? That's ultimately like, do you know how to do the very thing? Like exactly, have you done it before? Right. The second thing is um, like. Do you already have the thing ready? Like, is it done? Like, do you already have, let's say, in this instance, the ARPEX? Are they already done in your, in your garage or wherever they need to be, you know? And the third thing I would say is, do you even need to do it this way? 
right? Like, do you actually like why why should you crowdfund? And usually at this point, if you get to if you get the first two right, or you get the first two answers questioned, or the the first questions answered, then usually the reason you do it is for marketing. You know, obviously it's great for pre-sales too, but like essentially it's like marketing. It's really good for marketing, I think. You know, um, and so that would be my advice. Uh, if I coming from someone who did really poorly, right? Like that's something that if I would have known, I might have uh, not done it in at all, based off of the very first one. You know, the very first question. And so that's usually my advice to anybody who's interested. Um, yeah, because otherwise you'll be amongst the many of us failed Kickstarters. <laughs> There's a lot of us. And you don't want to be a part of that circle. It's it's very embarrassing. It's very um, it, it it sucks. But like I said, I don't regret it. I learned a lot from it. But just learn from me. You know, learn yeah. from all the other failures. Like make it's, your own mistakes. Make it, different ones. It's a boomerang that never stops coming back. Uh, <laughs> when you fail. Uh, okay. Uh, so, okay. I mean your perspective on things uh, or uh, your position in this art world is probably different than 99% of people who are listening to us and uh, because uh, basically I mean you're actually doing something similar that we're doing with the festival you have a base of your uh, followers who are actually your sponsors and as long as you as long as you make them happy with the knowledge that you provide to them, uh, they'll be supporting you. It's same thing with us here, you know, like uh, totally. as long as we're delivering what people are expecting and more, uh, mm -hmm. people will sponsor us. I mean, I call all of our attendees, I call them actually sponsors because we never had like a real sponsor. So uh, our attendees are, are sponsors of the of the event. Uh, so you're, I mean, okay. Like most of the most of the time, uh, you're uh, doing uh, education for uh, for others, uh, but you're still you you still have this drive to join uh, on other por uh, pro projects. I mean, you you still do get hired by uh, by clients or studios or uh, or or others. So you have this mm -hmm. motivation to work on some game project or, or other, right? Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. It keeps me it keeps me uh, fresh, right? Because when you're just working for yourself and you're working for, uh, like like you mentioned, your your sponsors or in or your supporters, uh, that's always great. Um, but what helps it to get better is to also be questioned, right? Because usually your supporters and your backers won't necessarily, um, you know, give you cr crazy criticism um, in a professional like sense. Like it's it's not as easy to get like advice on how to improve my artwork um, just from my peers alone either. It's helpful whenever you're like there's money on the line and you're working with a client and they expect a certain quality. That that challenges you in a way that it's hard to simulate. You know, it's really hard to simulate that. And regardless, and so like even if you are self accountable, like you make your own projects and you do your own thing. It's still very hard to simulate like that pressure of like somebody telling you that it needs to be done tomorrow. You know, um, the kind of pressure that I put on my students, right? Like I try to simulate as much as I can, but ultimately, like they're allowed to still fail, right? They're students; they're allowed to make a mistake and do poorly. I'm not going to fire them, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna explain to them why they made the mistakes and what they can do to improve them. In fact, I encourage them to be okay with failing. You know, sometimes they don't turn in homework because they're afraid of like getting like you know lashed out but i'm like no no no. i want you you want to be lashed out you want me to tell you why you sucked you know because it's safe this is a safe place to for that to happen i'm not doing it to like destroy you i'm here to to help you understand why it was a mistake and um but when you when you finally get that job that that kind of thing doesn't exist you know your client's not gonna be like you know what you tried your best we're still gonna pay you for more work you know <laughs> Like that doesn't, that's not how it works, you know? Uh, one other thing that I think that people who are listening can learn uh, from you, but also from other uh, successful uh, artists out there. And this is not 
related only to art this is related to life you know and other things that you do is uh, the way you communicate with uh, with either clients either your colleagues either uh, on, on the internet so uh, one of the big advantages in your case is uh, that you like uh, you like to communicate you could communicate you like to talk you're always ready to answer questions i remember when we started communicating about your first arrival to the ifcc uh i have a feeling that back then you were under a much uh, larger pressure you know uh, from fans and uh, the book was going <coughs> on and, and and other stuff so w what did happen is that sometimes you didn't answer a uh, uh, message but uh, it was never like uh, I never had this feeling that you're ignoring, you know, I just realized that you're like really uh, under heavy fire, you know, uh, and uh, but you're always open to, you know, to collaboration. Uh, it's never no, you know, when I communicate with you, it's never no about anything. It's always like, yeah, if I can, I'll do it. Uh, of course, uh, let's do it. Uh, and I think this is like really important. A lot of artists are like very like close person you know like they they they, they 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 don't like to interact and these days it's like really important to interact you know and in the mm -hmm. end nothing bad can happen you know like uh, i know i know like we had a lot of uh speakers at the event in the past because what i like doing is like discovering new talents you know people who are not famous but they're like very good and i like to bring them and put them on stage you know next to all the other like very famous guys so and in the in the past, uh, even even this last year, you know, we had we had folks who were like really who were afraid to go, you know, on stage, who were afraid to come to the event because they never did. They uh, where they, maybe they live in some smaller little town, you know, like somewhere uh, in some you know in some country far away, and they don't have this experience of communicating with people. And when they come to the to the event. They were like, wow, you know, like this was eye opening for me. You know, I met so many people. I got I got some yeah. job opportunities, you know, uh, they change, you know. And so yes, totally. and it's, the, it's the same thing like with, with clients and with people when you're working in a team. It's very important to communicate and it's very important to be nice. You know, this this can also be a decision. Uh, 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 this also can also change the decision for someone who, who wants to hire you, you know, so yeah so i think it's important to to communicate as well i think that's very valuable i understand though like why like artists might not want to it's it's really scary i understand you know um and i always say like you gotta like you gotta focus on your intention you know and my my philosophy on this is um <clears throat> my philosophy is pretty simple it's like I'm always trying to make friends, you know? And if you have this philosophy of like, you're just trying to make friends, you're just trying to, you know, connect with people, um, then it, it, it should, it shouldn't come off disingenuous. Like you mentioned that whenever you would reach out to me, it was never like, Oh, I'm too busy. I'm too big time for this guy. Uh, it was always either maybe cause I just didn't see it or I just didn't respond for whatever reason, but it was never disingenuous. Um, and that's because it isn't because I do consider you your friend, right? And so when you asked me to do this, I was like, yeah, man, let's do it. It's not a problem. And I was like, we just got to find a time. And then you asked me what's available. And I was like, yeah, this is available. Let's do it. You know? And it's not because I need to like push my, um, <clears throat> it's not like because I need to push my, my, uh, marketing stuff and I need to do all that kind of crazy things to, 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 to celebrate, who I am, it's because you asked me, you know, that's pretty much it. Right. And like, if you didn't ask me, I wouldn't have pursued you and be like, Oh, I need to like market like crazy. I need to reach out to all of my, my folks, you know, it was because you asked me and uh, I consider you're a good bud. And so it's no, it's no problem. Right. Uh, you know, even if there was a fear of like, you know, I know we were talking about earlier of like, Oh, maybe some people like some skeletons in the closet. It was to me, I'm like, nah, it's, he asked, it's fine. You know, and to me, like, that's really valuable. And I understand why a lot of people try to like, they don't do this because they're afraid. They're afraid of, you know, what the person's going to think of you, what, what they're going to feel like. And don't get me wrong. If you have a hard time to interact with people socially, that's something that you're just going to have to help 
like start to begin learning how to be better at. And you don't have to be great at it, right? You don't have to be like someone that's just like super charismatic and extrovert, right? You just got to be able to like find some common ground and just be able to talk to somebody, you know? That's it. And that goes a long way. You'd be surprised. And in fact, uh, when I did that talk in Barcelona, right, like a long time ago, there was this young uh, person in the audience who heard me talk about all this type of stuff, right? About like you should go out there and just try to make friends. <clears throat> you know, even with your classmates, like you should make friends with people that are similar to you or even maybe not as good as you. Because you shouldn't focus on, oh, I only should talk to the best. You should talk to everybody, right? And I made that point and then she was just like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, especially when I made the point of like, everybody gets good though. Like if that person that's not as good as you is motivated and stays focused, in a couple of years, they might be just as good, if not better than you, right? And if you were, if your intention was just to make friends with them rather than, oh, oh they're not worth my time because they're like really not, not very good artists, that's very short-sighted and it's not really nice, right? And, and people can feel that, right? And so I made that, that claim and then she had this whole perspective of like, she's got to like not talk to anybody. She's just got to keep her, like it's super competitive. I shouldn't make friends, you know? And she completely changed her philosophy. And then all of a sudden, she started to do really well in her career, right? And she, she messaged me about it. And she was just like, she said it changed her life, you know? And, and that because she was a very timid person before that too. And like I said, I don't think you should be like, you don't have to be like partying hard and be like this really talkative person. I just happen to do that, right? Uh, I see it succeed just by the sense of just making friends, Right. If you make friends, friends help friends, you know, and if you make friends with a lot of other artists, you make friends with recruiters, you make friends with people just in general. Right. I have I have a friend named Kenny who's a recruiter. Right. And he's never recruited me ever <laughs> on any kind of career that I needed. But he's always been a close buddy of mine. And every time I see him, it's always a pleasure. Right. And I just know that if there was ever a time where Kenny felt like he needed my work or I needed help or, or Kenny needed help from me or I needed help from Kenny, that it would be no problem. The you Kenny, know, Kenny does work for right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's a good guy. dude. And that's what I'm saying. Like it was never it was never beyond the fact like he, he's going to be like uh, he's going to give me this job right now. So I better be friends with him. Like I've been friends with him perpetually, regardless, you know. Because he's a good person and he's a great person to talk to. He's helped so many other artists and he sometimes will reach out and be like, Hey, do you know anybody? Or do you know? And I'll be like, yeah, I do. Like, here's somebody. Right. And, and I think that's very valuable. You guys have to recognize, you know? Um, and if you surround yourself with this kind of aura, people will, will gravitate towards it, you know? And, you know, there's this, this kind of philosophy of the ha the glass is half empty or half full. I'm sure you've heard of this, right? Where some people look at the glass as half empty, um, which is true, right? If you want to think of it that way. Or the glass is half full, which is also true, which if you want to think of it that way. I say, well, why can't you just keep filling the glass? Why don't you just fill the glass up yourself? You know? Like, let's go even more positive. Let's just remove the, like, like let's remove the negative aspect of it from all together. Why don't we just focus on looking at positive influences and positive things in our life? rather than focusing on all the, the crap stuff. Because if you look for all the crap stuff, you will see it. It's going to be there. And it will start to it will start to fill your life up faster than you would like it to, you know? And that's always been my philosophy. And it's helped me. It's helped me through a, a lot of hard times. And and let's, let's be clear. I have not been uh, immune to failure and hard times and problems. Like, that is inevitable for all of us, you know? And so... So, like, the only choice that I have is my, my perspective on it, right? And I usually try to have a more optimistic perspective, you know? And I, I always teach my kids this. I say try to be problem solvers, not problem makers. Because it's easier to make problems, right? Like, if I tell my uh, daughter, like, oh, you know, why don't you, like, do this on the skateboard? And she's like, well, I can't because my, my feet hurt or whatever. And I say, well, now you've created another problem, haven't you? Right? You've created another barrier for you for that makes it harder for you to do this thing on the skateboard instead of just why don't we just um, 
instead of saying, uh, oh, yeah, my feet hurt or whatever. So my feet hurt, but let me just rest for a second so that I can do it in a minute. You know, instead of just stopping the, the statement at my feet hurt, you then come up with a solution to that problem. You know, you be, become a problem solver. And I find a lot of people, a lot of artists will be problem makers. They'll be like, well, this is why I can't do it. And then that's it, period. You know, and although that might be true, they don't then come up with a solution to that problem. Like, for instance, um, let's say like, well, AJ, every time I post my artwork, uh, I don't get a lot of fans, you know, which might be true. But then I would say, well, what's what's your solution to that? You know, and then they might say something like, you know, I post a lot of artwork and I don't get a lot of fans. It's like, well, maybe maybe it's the kind of content of artwork. Maybe it's like what Marco said. I'm not focused. I'm posting all sorts of random stuff. Let me take a look at what I'm posting or how often am I posting? Oh, maybe I'm not posting often enough. Oh, okay, maybe that's the problem. Maybe I should just change my philosophy for a second. And I think when that happens, then you have what I like to think of actionable um, movement, right? You then have something that you can do following that problem that you've just recognized, right? So I I usually encourage this. And so like including like the social aspect of it is like, well, I don't have people that I can talk to. It's like, well, maybe I can start an online sketch group, right? Do you see kind of what I'm getting at? Like, I think it's like, instead of just stopping at the problem, which is very much could be true, like fill the glass up, start to fill the glass up is what I'm getting at. Instead of looking at it always half empty, just actually fill it up. So then there's no disputing that the glass is full. I will interrupt you a bit. Uh, because, uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have to uh, finish in like soon in 10, 20 minutes. And actually, we probably like, should finish like pretty soon. Yeah. I, I just looked at the time right now. Okay. You're right. Uh, so uh, the thing that they didn't mention is that uh, this stream, this video, you know, after after we're done, uh, will also be a part of the course that we're building. And this course is strictly about, uh, you know, doing business with your art. So, and this will be delivered at the IFCC Academy website, which is our online learning platform. And I really hope that... Uh, Anthony will join us there as well, you know, when he gets some free time from his own stuff. So, uh, because I would definitely like to continue talking about uh, uh, this topic with you as well. We'll also have other guests, but uh, it's always like really inspiring and, you know, to to talk to you and you always give some really good insights and things. Uh, So... If anyone is interested to join this uh, course, just like come to this website. It's the IFCC uh, Academy.com and you have a newsletter here. So just subscribe and that's all. So, uh, Anthony, tell me, uh, are you preparing any new uh, uh, trainings, any new courses on the Robert, <laughs> Pen- the Robert Pencil website? Uh, uh, currently, um, I'm actually probably going to take uh, the end of the year uh, like, like a few months off during Christmas, I'm going to revise some stuff, but ultimately I'm just going to teach more, um, more often. And I'm going to do more tutorials for sure. They're going to be available in multiple places, but, um, yeah, nothing, nothing dramatically new. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just doing the same old, same old, just trying to keep it pretty simple. Um, so if anyone's interested in my tutorials, my, um, lecture, like my actual mentorship. Yeah. Just visit rollupencil.net. That's the place to go to find this stuff. And, um, you can go to art station. They also have stuff there as, as well. Like you guys are welcome to explore and dive in however you like. Some people prefer art station platform. Some people prefer a uh, cube brush. Um, and I'm, I'm starting to build a platform on flipped. I think, I think it's flipped normals. Maybe not. I forget exactly the other website yeah, that is, does tutorials. Is. Okay, yeah. So, so wherever you know, like I'm posting wherever people prefer, and so it's a matter of just your preference. But like, um, I'm not necessarily going to stop anytime soon. I'm probably going to build more uh, free content mm-hmm. uh, on YouTube, just because I realize that I don't have enough of it there, and I probably should. So that way, people that can't even afford even a few dollars, because there are people that can't necessarily buy like. Uh, like thirty or forty dollars worth of my tutorials consistently, and I understand that and respect that, right? Uh, mostly like younger, younger people, and so uh, I feel like that's not necessarily something I should avoid. I should definitely be doing more of that as well. 
as and I so, said, as I said, I'm expecting you on our website as well and the IFCC Academy. But you know, we'll talk about it. But I know that uh, our our followers would definitely like it. Uh, so cool. uh, this is the Robert Pencil website. You have here. Uh, uh, the first link education you have like uh, mentorship tutorials and private club and then you have classrooms and so on and so on and this here is Anthony's uh, it's Robert Pencil uh, uh, YouTube uh, channel where he really posts a lot of uh, content you know back years and years back you know so uh, go check it out uh, we have to uh, you know finish this session now because uh, I just got a message from my wife that the kid is sleeping in the car and she can't, you know, like lift him up and bring him home. So, and I guess, I guess your family is also waiting for you. So, uh, just let me check if we have any more questions. Uh, I'm sure uh, we do. In, in, in the chat window, just a second. Uh, yeah, we can lighten you around it if there are. Okay, just uh, let me. I lost myself in all this. Uh, By the way, if any of you guys have like some deeper questions you would like some deeper answers to, you can always just email me on my website and I'll get to it eventually. So let's see. Okay, question. Okay, from Andrei Vasiliev uh, from. I don't want to say something wrong. Ukraine or Russia, I guess. Uh, Anthony, can you please describe uh, how your nowadays income is distributed between different ways of earning? Freelance, concept art, mentorship, selling art, prints, and so on, as a percentage. Okay, sure. Yeah, I think the it's 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 50-50, like freelance and education, right? So like uh, my tutorials, my mentorship takes like 50% of my income and the other is uh, freelance. But there was a time where it was like 90, 10, where like 90% of my income was all of my education and I rarely, rarely did any freelance. But I realized that I was starting to get a little too stagnant, which meant um, that's what made me want to do more freelance. Um, to get, you know, get my name on projects more and be able to like announce that I worked on a thing. That's very nice to put on your resume that you're, you're a current artist, you know, that so you, when you're educating people, it helps add more validity to your education. I'm not saying that you have to, because I know a lot of great educators that necessarily don't have like huge credits, but they're fantastic educators. I think for my brand, specifically like my mentorship, it actually uh, helps me. To be able to say, yeah, I just worked on the, like, for instance, the latest uh, League of Legends um, music video, right? That's really helpful. And so, because they want to give advice about working as a professional, because a lot of people, that's where they're coming for me, uh, for my mentorship, it has a little more validation. So I, th I think right now it's 50 50. Okay, people. So uh, the links are below in the description. You know, as I mentioned, if you want to join the, 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 the upcoming course, it will last all through the year. Just go to, to one of the websites. It doesn't matter where you subscribe. Uh, <clears throat> uh, anyways, Anthony, thank you so much. Uh, I hope we'll see each other soon somewhere. You know, I don't know where, but uh, <laughs> somewhere, I guess. Uh, and yeah, tell the modern day James to, you know, reach out for me. So I want to <laughs> ask him a few questions. And to modern rest, day james reach out dude yeah and uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and to others uh, thank you for joining us again uh, i hope uh, all the advices that uh, anthony gave you will be helpful but they will be helpful only if you practice what he preaches you know so don't be just like this uh, 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 uh those people who just uh, listen to tutorials and do nothing about it you know just you know uh, use it use the knowledge <clears throat> totally all right, man. See you guys later. Okay, I'm 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 gonna stop this uh, this session. I stop streaming now. <laughs>